Good evening, everyone. So welcome again to our fireside chat, uh, which is happening every Thursday. And today our speaker is from United Kingdom. Uh, from <clears throat> He's a consultant, uh, physician and nephrologist from Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust. However, he's born and raised in Tanzania, um, been trained in Muhimbili and Bugando. He is the first uh, person to open dialysis center in the Lake Zone. Also, he's an active member of Nephrology Society of Tanzania, and he has always been there for his fellow doctors and nephrologists. Today, he's going to talk about uh, renal transplantation in COVID era. And may I now welcome Dr. Mubarak Jan Muhammad. Karibu sana, Dr. Asante sana, Frida. Thank you very much. Greetings to everybody from the uh, Nephrology Society of Tanzania, United Kingdom chapter. Um, it's always a pleasure to address this uh, privileged platform. I understand uh, that uh, although this is the African Healthcare Network fireside chat, there are participants from many countries, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Lloyd, how many countries are represented in the participants uh, today? Oh, uh... Uh, a lot. <laughs> we have uh, 2,300 people on the database now. Uh, we are enlarging it now. So I hope that we will have very much more outside, a lot more outside too. Yeah. But predominantly it's Tanzania and Kenya, uh, yeah, Uganda and Burundi. Yes. Fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. So this uh, gives uh, everybody an opportunity to share their experiences and knowledge and uh, you know, to share best practice across the different geographic locations where we are uh, all practicing in. Um, uh, this afternoon's talk, uh, sorry, in the United Kingdom, it's around four o'clock, so I'm saying afternoon. So this afternoon's uh, discussion is about uh, the kidney transplant recipient uh, in the COVID era. And the discussion will basically uh, be around management of COVID-19 infection in the kidney transplant recipient. Uh, this was a presentation that I delivered at the annual NESOT conference in, uh, in Dar es Salaam last year. And uh, Dr. Lloyd uh, requested me to present this once more on this uh, esteemed platform uh, so that uh, uh, this discussion can be uh, had with the uh, wide range of participants that are there. Um, if anybody wants to add anything or contribute anything, please feel free. Uh, this is an era. This is an area that is constantly being studied. A lot of research is currently happening as we speak, so it is quite a dynamic uh, uh, field uh, to say. So, without taking much of your time, I will share my slides with you. Just an overview of what we are going to discuss. We will first talk about in in uh, in a few words uh, diagnosis of covid-19 infection in the patient who is a kidney transplant recipient and then we will touch on the management of covid-19 infection where we will explore uh, different options that are there in managing uh, these patients we will then uh, discuss in depth about immunosuppression and changes to immunosuppression and we will explore various therapeutic options that are present currently in, uh, in, uh, in management of COVID-19 in the transplant recipient. And then finally, we will conclude and try and derive some important take home messages from this discussion. As we all know, most patients with COVID-19 infection, including our kidney transplant recipients, present with mild symptoms. And this is more, uh, now even more true with these new variants that are coming in, with Omicron variants that uh, arose in uh, uh, towards the end of last year, we realized that yes, the infectivity was very uh, high, uh, but the virulence of the pathogen was significantly low. And therefore this translated into a lower number of hospital admissions and even a lower number of ITU admissions and mortality. The same goes for the Delta Micron variant, which is the current variant that is uh, that has infected almost uh, in patients in all, across uh, almost 40 countries. Um, so most patients with COVID-19 have mild symptoms and would not require any hospital admission. By far, the commonest symptom so far uh, is, is pyrexia or fever. And in, the, and in the context of a kidney transplant recipient, we need to rule out other causes of pyrexia. Uh, 
So fever, for example, in a kidney transplant recipient, even in, 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 uh, in an area which is known for high transmission of the COVID-19 virus, would not necessarily be as a result of COVID-19 infection. There could be other important causes of fever that need to be ruled out. However, when you're dealing with the kidney transplant recipient, it is important for you to have a high index of suspicion because these, this group of patients may not necessarily present with the typical clinical and radiological features of COVID-19 infection. And in this context, the COVID-19 real-time PCR test is the gold standard test in clinical practice. And we have seen patients in the UK who present with a negative rapid test, but would still go on to have a strongly positive uh, PCR test. And therefore, this remains the gold standard in the diagnosis of COVID-19 infection. When it comes to treatment, now you must all be aware of the, of the massive changes in treatment guidelines between countries, between centers, and between different ge geographical locations. Local treatment guidelines differ. Each country, each center has its own guidelines, its own protocol, but if you look at these guidelines uh, from a bird's eye view, you will appreciate the fact that most of this treatment is largely supportive care. So for example, if the patient presents with a temperature, we give antipyretics. If the patient is dehydrated, we give IV fluids. If the patient is dyspneic and is desaturating on room air, then we ad administer uh, oxygen therapy to this patient, et cetera, et cetera. So the treatment is largely supportive. However, it is important to number one, try and rule out the presence of a bacterial infection, especially in this patient who is a transplant recipient, because this patient is on immunosuppression and therefore is at a high risk of developing a viral, but yes, uh, but as, as, as well as bacterial infection. And in this scenario, it's very difficult to differentiate between a viral and a bacterial infection clinically especially if the source of the bacterial infection is not clear. However, we can do procalcitonin levels, which are in the, in the developed world, they are part of the routine blood tests which form the COVID panel. And a procalcitonin level of more than 0 0.5 points strongly towards the presence of a bacterial infection, in which case antibiotic therapy would be indicated. So that's number one. We have to rule out the presence of a bacterial infection. Secondly, we have to manage the oxygen requirement of the patients appropriately and provide appropriate respiratory support. So most patients would require oxygen through nasal specs or through a non rebreathe mask, but it is important to monitor the oxygen saturation. And the best way to monitor the oxygen saturation is to do an arterial blood gas. That gives, that gives you a very uh, uh, targeted oxygen saturation in that particular patient. Patients who are hypotensive and have got reduced peripheral circulation, if you try and use a finger oxygen saturation monitor, then it's very difficult to get an accurate reading. However, we normally use this, these devices because they are easy to care and they are non-invasive. And ideally, when it comes to oxygen requirements or saturation targets, I would divide patients into two groups. The first group of patients are those, those patients who are known to have COPD. In this scenario, the target oxygen saturation should be 88 to 92% on room air. That's your target. So anything less than that would require of oxygen support. And the other group of patients are those without any chronic lung diseases. And in the context of COVID-19 infection, it is practical to keep an oxygen target uh, uh, a saturation of at least more than 92% in these patients. It is important to realize one fact, and I got this from the respiratory team. It was a learning point for me, actually, that when we are monitoring these patients' oxygen saturations, do not measure their oxygen saturation when the patient is mobilizing. Because in this scenario, the oxygen saturation is bound to drop, and you may end up keeping this patient in the hospital unnecessarily. So this is where oxygen is concerned. And lastly, but most importantly, each patient should have an individualized escalation plan. What does this mean? This means how far are you going to go in your intervention, in your management of this patient? So for example, if you have a 95 year old, frail, small lady, 
who has had multiple fractures, who is bed bound, who has got a background of multiple significant comorbidities, who now comes in with COVID-19 infection, are you going to actively resuscitate this patient and shove tubes down her throat to try and ventilate her? The answer is unlikely, because that would the risk of of such significant such a, a intervention is more than the benefit that comes with it. So these escalation plans, uh, these uh, uh, expectations should be discussed with the patient if possible, and particularly with the next of kin. And the escalation plan should be clearly documented. Should this patient be taken to ITU? Will the patient benefit from ITU treatment? If yes, then definitely we will take this patient to ITU. We will intervene. We will intubate, ventilate, etc. If not, then these plans should be clearly documented and these expectations should be managed. Now, if, when it comes to immunosuppression, the first line of management as with any other viral illness in the kidney transplant recipient, is to discontinue antiproliferative agents. So mycophenolate or azathioprine should be discontinued, as is standard practice in a kidney transplant recipient. We normally discontinue MMF or AZA, and usually we double the dose of steroids in these patients. And these drugs can be restarted once the patients are fully recovered. So in practice, uh, and, and, and I'll give you uh, the, the example of, of the center where I practice in, we discharge these patients on a CNI and on the doubled dose of steroids. And when we see them in clinic and we are 100% certain that these patients have now recovered, their numbers are now improving, that's when we uh, scale back the dose of steroids and we reintroduce antiproliferative agents initially at a lower dose, and then we go back to their usual dose. What about calcineurin inhibitors? So calcineurin inhibitors are a group of drugs that inhibit, as the name suggests, an enzyme called calcineurin. Calcineurin is an enzyme that come together with cyclophilins, which are another group of enzymes within the cells. So these, so the calcineurin cyclophilin complex is very crucial in cellular transduction and signaling pathways. One of the most important function of calcineurin is T cell activation. And this is where CNIs come handy. They inhibit the cellular transduction and signaling pathway and they prevent T cell activation in our kidney transplant recipient. But these cyclophilins are also important in viral replication and growth. So in essence, CNIs actually bind to these proteins and help inhibit viral replication in the context of coron human coronavirus. Do we have data to support this? The answer is yes. This was a study that was uh, published in, in this journal. You can uh, uh, read this paper at your own free time. If you, you can document this uh, reference. And if you see these graphs, the red line is the line that looks at cellular viability. It basically tells us whether the dose of the tacrolimus was toxic to the cells or not. And the black line on the graph is, is the line that tells us the degree of uh, replication. So at small doses, as, as you can see from these graphs, tacrolimus significantly suppressed viral replication of human coronaviruses. At the same time, it was very minimally toxic to the cells. So cell viability was almost normal or maintained. It was stable. But there was significant drop in the replication of the viral particles. The same finding was replicated when cyclosporin A was studied separately. And therefore, this finding is can be generalized to the family of uh, CNIs in general. Now, in the COVID-19 infected kidney transplant recipient, we want to ask ourselves, how much are we ready to suppress this patient's immune system versus the viral suppression? Because these are two inversely related entities. The more immunosuppressed the patient is, the more the virus will, re will replicate. So we have to maintain that fine line. And therefore, in order to do that, 
we need to review the total burden of immunosuppression that this patient is having. Therefore, in the asymptomatic COVID-19 infected kidney transplant recipient, the key word here, ladies and gentlemen, is asymptomatic. So in the asymptomatic patient, you should consider dose reduction. You don't have to reduce the dose. However, you should have a low threshold to reduce the dose should the patient be at a risk of developing symptoms or if the patient does develop symptoms. As a general rule of thumb, it is important to try and maintain lower levels of your CNI. So for example, when it comes to tetrolimus, try and maintain a level of around 3.5 3 to 4. And when it comes to cyclosporine A, you're looking at a level of, for example, between 60 to 80. Hope we are together so far. Are we together so far? Yes. 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 Oh, fine. I thought everybody fell asleep. Okay. Right. So we've tackled our uh, MMF and AZA, the anti-proliferative agents, and we've also discussed about CNIs. Question, what about steroids? Should patients with COVID-19 infection get high-dose steroids, or should we just continue with the normal-dose steroids? So anecdotal data suggests that patients who do benefit with high-dose steroids, particularly those patients who have documented lung injury based on your imaging studies. So CT scan or chest X-ray. And this anecdotal data also suggests that parenteral administration of dexamethasone has been beneficial and the adverse effects have been minimal. Ladies and gentlemen, this data is anecdotal and therefore it does not have a good evidence base. So we will now examine the evidence in as far as steroid administration is concerned. This study was published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases in 2017, and they looked at uh, viral load shedding, especially in patients who are infected with human coronavirus or in cell cultures, rather, infected artificially with human coronaviruses. And they found out that high dose steroids were actually associated with prolonged viral shedding particularly in patients who are recipients of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So there is a problem, Kunatatizo. What is the other problem? In porcine, uh, when, when patients were, uh, uh, in, in, when pigs were infected with respiratory coronaviruses, so in porcine uh, coronavirus infection, early dose of dexamethasone was effective in reducing uh, the pro-inflammatory response. However, prolonged use of dexamethasone actually enhanced or encouraged viral replication. And when I mean prolonged, when I say prolonged, I actually mean from day eight onwards, post inoculation of human coronaviruses in the porcine cell culture. So this is now giving us mixed, uh, mixed data, isn't it? Initially, anecdotal data suggested benefit However, these studies are actually showing that prolonged use is prolonging viral uh, shedding and enhancing viral replication. There's another study that was, that was published last year in the journal Respiration, which showed that short-term early use of corticosteroids could actually suppress immune cells, and therefore it may prolong severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, coronavirus shedding in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. And, this, and uh, this paper, which was published in The Lancet two years ago, actually uh, su uh, summarizes the outcomes of corticosteroid therapy amongst the different uh, human coronaviruses. So if you quickly go through this table, especially in the second column, so this study shows delayed clearance of viral RNA, again, delayed clearance of viral RNA, uh, as significant adverse effects of corticosteroid therapy, psychosis, diabetes, a vascular necrosis of the femoral head in, in survivors. As far as influenza virus is concerned, it actually, uh, steroid therapy increases mortality. And we look at the respiratory syncytial virus in children, there is no clinical benefit of administering steroids. So you guys must be saying, what is this guy trying to say? What is this guy trying to aim at? As far as steroid use is concerned, this is the conclusion. The Lancet 
journal actually concluded that corticosteroid treatment should not be used in COVID-19 induced lung injury or in COVID-19 induced shock outside of a clinical trial. Because there is no unique reason that exists to expect that patients may benefit from this administration of steroids. And in a meta-analysis of corticosteroid use in patients with SARS, only four studies provided conclusive data and all of them indicated harm. What is the recommendation then? According to the United Kingdom Kidney Association, which was previously called the Renal Association, for asymptomatic kidney transplant recipients who come to hospital or who present with COVID-19 infection, number one, as we discussed, stop MMF and ASA. Number two, we need to review the total burden of immunosuppression. And, this, and in this asymptomatic patient, we should have a low threshold to reduce the, dose, the total dose of, this, of CNI. High or increased dose of steroids is not recommended at, at early stages of COVID-19 infection. These transplant recipients should self-isolate in line with national guidance. And the nephrology team should try and monitor these patients remotely for change in symptoms. So when we say remotely, it can be through a telephone call, it can be through a WhatsApp video call, it can, you can use Zoom or Microsoft Teams, etc. But these patients should be monitored whilst they are in self-isolation. Once they are better, we can consider restarting immunosuppression 14 days after the onset of symptoms. If they are symptom-free, in the absence of any antipyretics for a minimum of three days. So if the patient has no temperatures, and has not used paracetamol or any other antipyretic for three consecutive days, then yes, you can restart uh, immunosuppression, MMF and ASA. Consider early monitoring of graft function when safe to do so, and when risk of transmission to others is low. This statement basically means what? It means that you may consider bringing the patient back to your clinic, back to hospital, when it is safe to do so in the context of hospital uh, transmitted COVID-19 infection. And the UK Kidney Association also says that prolonged viral shedding in immunosuppressed patients and the risk of disease transmission must be reviewed in an area separate to non-affected individuals. So these transplant recipients should not be seen in the, in the normal clinic where, where other patients are also being reviewed. Ideally, transplant recipients should be seen in a separate area. Now, this particular thing is also quite challenging in, in the developed world as well. So we do strive to try and isolate transplant recipients when they come to hospital, but it is not practical to do so in many centers. We, this was about asymptomatic patients. What about those patients who come to hospital and have been admitted? So from the data that is available, we do know that mortality rises to almost 50% in those patients requiring ITU admission. And this is data from Chinese studies. In the UK, early data suggested that the case fatality rate in hospitalized transplant recipients was between 12 to 16%, so an average of 15%. And this is data from NHSBT and the renal registry. If you look at other European countries, in Spain, for example, the case fatality rate in solid organ transplant patients was almost 30%. But what has been observed generally is that there is rapid deterior deterioration in the requirement of ventilation roughly one week after the onset of symptoms within the kidney transplant recipient cohort. And this, this paper uh, showed all the data from different countries. In the UK, they gathered data from different ICUs and they found out that patients with COVID-19 who were admitted to the ICU, almost 25 to 30% required uh, renal uh, replacement therapy or renal support with dialysis or filtration. This just highlights this, uh, the uh, magnitude of uh, morbidity in these patients who are admitted to hospital. And if you study the indication for admission in these transplant recipients, it's not different from patients who are not transplant recipients. So number one is hypoxia, when the saturations drop to less than 95% on air. Number two is tachypnea, 
And number three are chest X-ray findings consistent with COVID-19 pneumonia. What are the recommendations again when it comes to inpatients? So number one recommendation, as we discussed earlier, was to stop antiproliferative agents. Number two, here you don't have the time to start considering the drop in your dose of CNIs. You have to drop the dose of your CNIs. Or in patients who are very unwell, you have to stop CNIs altogether. So don't hesitate to stop tetrolimus in patients who are very unwell. It's better to discharge a kidney transplant recipient with a failed graft on dialysis rather than to send the patient home in a coffin. So don't hesitate to stop CNIs in this group of patients. Number three, we have to stop all nephrotoxics. So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, et cetera, these have to be stopped. Number four, we should have a low threshold to commence antibiotic therapy if there is even a slight indication that there may be presence of a bacterial infection. As far as oxygen requirements are concerned, we have already discussed this. In patients who do not have COPD, we should be aiming for an oxygen saturation of more than 92%. We should monitor the volume status of these patients and administer IV fluids. However, we should not be overzealous and we should avoid uh, precipitating fluid overload. A huge chunk of the mortality, especially in patients who are admitted to ITU, is when patients become fluid overloaded because of overzealous administration of IV fluid. And then very importantly, we should start administration, early administration of VTE prophylaxis. So low molecular weight heparin, etc. And these should be appropriately renally dosed. This is extremely important. And as discussed earlier, we should discuss the ceiling of care with the patient if, if uh, the patient is in a state to, discuss, to have this discussion or with the next of kin. It is a known fact that the mortality rate in ITU patients is almost 50%. In patients who, de who develop a respiratory distress syndrome, there is a role of methylprednisolone, which, which will be uh, uh, shown in the next slide. And yes, we can begin antiviral therapy for COVID-19 infection in line with local protocols. So if you have a protocol which encourages you to start administration of remdesivir, for example, then by far you should just go ahead and, 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 and commence that treatment. But I understand that protocols differ from center to center. So the take home message here is follow your local guideline or protocol. This slide shows you the importance of administration of methyl pred in patients with acute respiratory distress. And, and as, as you can see from the graph, patients who are given methyl pred have a significantly improved overall uh, survival compared to those who are not given methyl pred in uh, respiratory uh, distress. Now, we come to antiviral therapy. There's so, many, there's so much information out there that even for the medical professional, it becomes difficult to identify what, is, uh, what, what you should implement and what you should ignore. Remdesivir is one of those drugs that has gained a lot of fame over the last 12 to 18 months. And currently, towards the end of last year, a lot of other therapies also came to light. The question is whether we should be using remdesivir or whether we should be going for other therapeutic options such as anti-cytokine therapy. As far as remdesivir is concerned, there was a lot of excitement when it was first introduced into the market. And if I give you my uh, experience, for example, I was very excited when remdesivir was introduced in my hospital, and I was quite keen to commence patients on remdesivir when, whenever they fulfilled the criteria. However, I did not find any uh, significant difference in those patients who received remdesivir versus those who did not, as far as outcomes were concerned. And then when you look at the... Uh, at, uh, the evidence at the studies that are available, then the evidence base is actually questionable as far as remdesivir is concerned. And I'm sure you would agree with me that not all the, not all the studies that are conducted show significant improvement in as far as outcomes and mortality is concerned. So as far as remdesivir is concerned, I would again uh, echo what I said earlier, i.e. follow your local guidance. But let's examine the new therapies, the anti-cytokine therapies. So tocilizumab and serilumab are, are two drugs that have gained fame following uh, uh, evidence from the remap cap trial. And this trial has actually uh, demonstrated 
that uh, equivalent beneficial effects from both these interleukin-6 inhibitors, especially when it comes to uh, survival outcomes and requirement for organ support. So yes, interleukin-6 inhibitors can be prescribed to your patient. However, there are certain criteria that need to be fulfilled. So the first criteria is your COVID-19 infection should be confirmed microbiologically, wherever there is high level of confidence, and you should evaluate both clinical as well as radiological features that would suggest COVID-19 infection. So that's the first criteria. Plus, these patients should not have been treated during this episode with any other anti-leukin-6 inhibitor. And they should be receiving dexamethasone or equivalent steroid dose unless contraindicated. And they should either have a reduced oxygen saturation of less than 92% on room air, or they should be at an early stage of critical illness requiring some sort of respiratory support. So this is the criteria to administer anti-cytokine therapy. You guys must be thinking, why don't you get to the point? What about transplant recipients? Because this is for normal patients, who, patients who do not have a kidney transplant. So this study was done uh, comparing anti-cytokine uh, therapy between transplant recipients and, and patients who did not have a transplant. And if you look at the um, outcomes, particularly mortality, it is almost similar, which tells you what? This tells you that you can administer anti-cytokine therapy to your patients with a kidney transplant. Again, recently, as of uh, 31st December, there have been new drugs that have entered into the market here in the UK. Paxlovid is one of these antiviral medication, which is a combination of two different ingredients. Uh, and both of these, I think, are protease inhibitors, ritonavir, yes, but there's another agent called PF07321332, et cetera. So this is a protease inhibitor and it inhibits viral replication. In the UK, this drug has already been licensed for use in patients with COVID-19 infection. There's another drug called sotrovimab. This is a neutralizing monoclonal antibody. It is still being investigated as part of the recovery trial, but we do not have any data on the use of this monoclonal antibody amongst patients with a kidney transplant yet. So to conclude this discussion, the take home messages are that our kidney transplant recipients may not display typical symptoms because all these symptoms are a function of the immune system and our patients are significantly immunosuppressed, number one. Number two, therefore, when this patient comes to you or presents to you in the hospital in order to make a diagnosis of COVID-19 infection, we should all have a high index of suspicion. And we should ask ourselves whether or not these patients could be managed at home if they are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, or should they be brought into hospital, keeping in mind the risk of in-hospital infection of COVID-19 and other in-hospital infections. We should consider the different pharmacological options that we have to manage COVID-19 infection, particularly in the context of immunosuppression that these patients are already on. These patients should be managed through a multidisciplinary team approach, we need to involve the transplant coordinator. We need to involve the dialysis unit if the patients require organ support. We need to involve physiotherapists, occupational therapists. We need a multidisciplinary team approach. And yes, we need to constantly update and talk to our patients and relatives and our communication should be clear. This can be challenging, especially uh, we, uh, when we know that during COVID-19, relatives are not allowed to uh, visit their uh, patients in the hospital, but we should try and make use of available resources to, uh, to, to constantly keep in touch with, with, with the patient's relatives. We should all follow our local policy and protocols wherever these are applicable. Thank you very much. I will stop sh uh, screen sharing now. Thank you so much, Dr. Mubarak, for your nice presentation. And um, if anybody has a question, Please, you can show a raise hand. And to begin with, we'll start uh, with some questions from the chat box. So the first one is John Caroli uh, asking which steroid is recommended? So 
The steroids that are recommended again differ. Some centers recommend prednisolone. Most centers have continued the use of dexamethasone, although as you have seen from the evidence, the evidence base is questionable when it comes to steroid use. The anecdotal data favors the use of dexamethasone. Other studies do not favor the use of dexamethasone. So it all depends on what your local guidance is. My hospital continues to recommend uh, dexamethasone in patients who are oxygen dependent. And this can be given at a dose of six milligrams daily, either orally or IV if the patient cannot take oral medication for a period of five to six days. Thank you. Another one from Muhammad Khan. What dose of DEXA you consider as a high dose? And the second question from him is, do you recommend any antiviral in the case of prolonged viral shading in CKD? So and as, as far as the first question is concerned, I've already mentioned what is the recommended dose of dexamethasone in my center. It is about six milligrams. I think a high dose would be any, any dose of more than eight milligrams in, in, in patients. That's considered a high dose of steroid. In as far as uh, antiviral is concerned, antiviral use is concerned in patients with CKD, uh, CKD does not uh, dictate what antiviral you can use as you have seen from the evidence. Uh, remdesivir can be used if that is easily available. However, I have personally not seen any uh, difference in outcomes in patients who, re who have received remdesivir versus those who did not. Anticytokine therapy can also be considered. You should refer to the renal drug handbook or BNF to try and dose your anticytokine therapeutic agents uh, appropriately as per the EGFR. But I don't think there is any significant dose reduction that, uh, that is necessary. Thank you. Another comment from John Mumbi. Uh, it says a word of recommendation about steroids with respect uh, to recovery trial. Uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine. So I think those were, was uh, the trial about kidney transplant or just all of the COVID patients? I didn't understand Frida. Okay, in the chat, there's a doctor who wanted to comment about steroid in respect to recovery trial. Yeah, what is his comment? Uh, about steroids. He just want to recommend, but I think that trial was on all COVID patients. I don't know if there was a subset in transplant patients. I think this was the recovery trial was in all COVID uh, yes. infected patients. Mazu is saying, thank you, doctor. Do you see patient with recent mild COVID infection with decreasing grass function? If so, do you biopsy them? What histology picture have been seen and what is your approach to immunosuppressive management in that case? So yes, we have seen uh, uh, patients, transplant recipients with mild infection. Uh, no, we don't routinely biopsy their grafts unless of course you are expecting uh, any sort of rejection in these patients. Um, uh, we manage them as I have uh, mentioned uh, in my presentation, uh, following the uh, UK Kidney Association guidelines. Thank you. Mazhal is saying, what is your take on COVID vaccination in transplant patients in regards to the time of vaccination before versus after transplantation, number of vaccination, primary and booster? Also, any data suggesting better outcome in transplant patients who are vaccinated versus those who not? So the timing of the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, we strive to vaccinate all our CKD patients before they receive a kidney transplant. That's our main aim. If they have already received their kidney transplant, then we can vaccinate them after they have received their kidney transplant, which is fine. There is no particular time uh, guideline in as far as timing of the initial and the booster vaccine is concerned. There was some confusion about this initially, but that confusion or those fears have been allayed. Uh, as far as, uh, what was the other question? Sorry, Frida, from Mazhar. Uh, vaccine and outcome, those who are vaccinated and those who are not. Definitely, it goes without saying that outcome for patients was much better in those who were vaccinated. And this was the first group of patients who we encouraged to be fully vaccinated and including a third booster dose as well. Okay. 
Thank you. Dr. Krabi is asking, in the background of COVID and post-transplant patient, will you consider early dialysis in patients who develop ACI, or will you wait for the indication we know? So in whatever context you develop an acute kidney injury, uh, the, uh, the notion that early dialysis helps with outcomes is not a, a true notion. Dialysis should only be administered when medical therapy has failed or when indications for dialysis are present. These indications may be, number one, acidosis, which is refractory to medical therapy. Number two, features of uremia. Number three, hyperkalemia, that is refractory to medical therapy. Number four, edema, that is refractory to medical therapy. And number five, when the patient is oligoanuric. In that case, you have to dialyze these patients. Early dialysis uh, does not have any beneficial outcomes versus uh, compared to patients who are dialyzed when these indications appear. Thank you. And Dr. Lloyd is asking, renal transplant PCR test negative or no test available and disease clinically COVID most likely. What would be suggested approach? That's a very good question, Dr. Lloyd. You're pressing a very raw nerve here. So I'll give you my experience. I had a patient on my ward uh, who was not a transplant recipient, but came in with clinical features and X-ray findings suggestive of COVID-19. A rapid test was negative, so was a PCR test. And I spoke to a microbiologist. He recommended to repeat the PCR test. The repeat PCR was also negative. And the microbiologist asked me to repeat the PCR test for a third time. That was also negative. And the fourth time, the microbiologist told me, just treat it as clinical COVID. So the, your clinical uh, acumen precedes every other test or investigation modality. If the patient has presented to you clinically with features of COVID, and you do not feel that this, uh, this, uh, pre this presentation is due to any other condition, then yes, by far, you can continue and manage this patient as a COVID-19 patient. So this is like a, a picture that we see in the developing world. Quite Absolutely. Often. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. You will. Thank you. Uh, Rajinda Bima is also asking, why do you recommend stopping ACI ARB in patients with severe COVID-19? So these patients, uh, so AC, in, AC inhibitors and ARBs should be stopped in any uh, patient taking them in the context of any severe illness. When you have COVID-19 infection, severe COVID-19 infection, these patients develop sepsis, particularly in the context of uh, a bacterial infection or even in the context of a cytokine storm. And when their blood pressure drops, uh, their GFR drops, and ACE inhibitors and ARBs are known to drop the GFR anyways. So combination of these two factors can precipitate or can worsen AKI. In that scenario, it is always better to temporarily withhold ACE inhibitors or ARB therapy up until the time when the patient is more stable. If the patient is hypertensive, it is always uh, reasonable to consider other forms of antihypertensive therapy like calcium channel inhibitors, for example, uh, amlodipine, nifedipine, or doxazosin, which is a short, uh, short acting vasodilator. Thank you. So, um... We have two raised hands. Maybe we should start with again with Dr. Rajinda Bima. If you have anything to say or to add, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Jamal Mohammed, for that excellent presentation. Uh, COVID-19 is not uh, something that anyone has been spared. Uh, we've had two patients uh, who came in with very severe disease. Uh, I must say, <laughs> I didn't think that I'm stopping the a, uh, ACE inhibitors uh, was absolutely mandatory, so we just carried on with it. But we treated them and they did well. Uh, fortunately, they didn't end up with severe hypotension or something. Um, <clears throat> the question I'm asking is, and I'm, by the way, a pediatrician, I'm not treating adults, okay? Is that when you get severe COVID-19, you spoke about all the um, stopping the um, MMF or aspirin and reducing CMS. What about the other um, immunosuppressive agents like sarolimus, et cetera? 
sorry, uh, Dr. Bima, which immunosuppression? Uh, like immunos serolimus, if they are, they, uh, they are on mTOR inhibitors. Oh, mTOR inhibitors. Yeah. It, again, we have to everolimus, serolimus. These drugs should be either reduced in dose to try and uh, uh, achieve minimal uh, dosing levels. And in severe COVID-19 infection, we should stop these uh, mTOR inhibitors as well. It, it is very important in the context of severe uh, infection to yep. prioritize patient survival over graft survival. Yeah, I agree. Just that there was a publication that showed that mTOR inhibitors might be actually useful and stop viral replication. What do you think of that? We don't have experience as far yeah. as, uh, uh, we, we don't have many patients on mTOR inhibitors. Yeah. There may be yeah. anecdotal data and some evidence, but uh, when it comes to a patient who is lying on your couch, who is, who is septic from COVID-19, you would definitely not continue with mTOR inhibitor therapy at that point in time. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome also Dr. Joseph Mtarindwa from Rwanda. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jan Muhammad, for this uh, presentation in management of a new threat to mankind, particularly in those that uh, the, the medical world has given a hope of a new life. I'm talking about kidney transplant patients. Uh, but your presentation has actually raised in me, you know, a number of depressions and questions. Um, what, what, one of them is, what is it about um, you know, uh, anti proliferants uh, like uh, MMF and, uh, and, and azathioprine vis a vis uh, carcinogen uh, inhibitors that make you want, because the anti I mean, make you want to, to stop them, to stop the, you know, a, a, the anti, anti proliferants, and yet you only don't give so much importance. In, in stopping, okay, you said reduce the dose or maybe stop them later because we know basically what they do, is what they say, this about, you know, the immunosuppressive drugs is, is, is actually, you, you are trying to suppress uh, T, -cell, T, T cell activation. So in, in, in one situation, it is actually to block a certain pathway like in calcium inhibitors and in the other one is actually to to, 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 to suppress their numbers. Now, at the end of it, then um, maybe <laughs> the take home message you want to take at this particular time, when, when uh, COVID-19 is tracking a transplant patients, you might be forced to take either of the two options to save the graft or to concentrate on the lungs and forget about the kidney. So I, I, would, like to, I would like your comments on that. Joseph, as a nephrologist, you never forget about the kidney, my friend. <laughs> but you yeah, asked a very... When I was in training in South Africa, very, they had, they had this place, this that nephrologist can uh, <laughs> kill the patient while he's trying to save the kidney. So I still no. have that a nephrologist never kills the patient. A nephrologist always saves the patient. Any doctor saves the patient. But of your course, question but... is very valid about anti-proliferative agents, why we stop anti-proliferative agents whilst we continue CNIs. So number one, that is the rule of thumb for any transplant recipient, kidney transplant recipient who presents with any infection. The, uh, the, the evidence that we have from multiple studies looking at the outcome shows that stopping pro anti-proliferative agents helps the patient's immune system mount an immune response against the invading pathogen. However, one of the commonest uh, effects of proliferative agents is uh, suppression of the white blood cells and suppression of the cellular response as far as the immune response is concerned. And therefore we stop MMF and ASA. At the same time, we double or increase the dose of the prednisolone that the patient is taking. So we don't only suppress, stop the MMF and sit back and relax. We, we look at the other forms of, immune, of the immune response, like humoral immunity, and we double the dose of steroids. As far as CNIs are concerned, we can either continue CNIs. They are uh, crucial in white blood cell, in T cell activation, and not in neutrophil activation, T cell activation, and obviously indirectly, these, all, all these mechanisms are linked but from the available evidence, it shows that when you continue CNI, 
after stopping antiproliferative agents, you are maintaining that balance of graft survival and patient survival in the context of an infection. However, in the patient who is very unwell, septic, you have to stop your CNIs or reduce their dose considerably. Patient survival always takes precedence over graft survival. I don't mind to, I would not mind to dialyze my patient, make, uh, provided the patient stays alive. That is the, that is the take home message. Yeah, maybe you're right. Um, in the context of the environment you're practicing in the UK, um, um, and maybe in our environment here, I mean, for somebody who has, for somebody who has uh, had a, a graft that is functioning, uh, and I'm talking about an you know, environment because the dialysis is very expensive here. Um, most patients actually can't afford, don't afford it. Maybe the difference between your environment in the UK and here is is probably for us we have to hang on to the to the graft. Um, for much longer than probably in your case in the UK. But no, I agree no, no. with you. No, jo Joseph, Joseph, dialysis here is also very expensive. And when, I'm, when I was answering your question, I was answering it from a Tanzanian perspective. Although okay. I'm in the UK, my heart is in Tanzania. I know exactly what is the situation on the ground in Tanzania. And I communicate with colleagues and I, uh, you know, I, I continue to uh, visit Tanzania and practice in Tanzania every year. So I, I'm totally aware of the situation on the ground. And this is standard practice worldwide. So even my colleagues in Tanzania uh, stop MMF and ASA in the context of an infection. Francis is here. I think I, I just saw him raise his hand. Maybe Francis can uh, shed more light on, on the practice in, in Tanzania. And uh, Dr. Twahir is also there from Kenya. So he can also shed, shed us some light uh, on the practice in Kenya as well. Yeah, okay, let me just uh, add, in Kenya, we stopped the MMF for ASA, and just for the reason that uh, these are very potent immunosuppressants, uh, we fear that uh, the patient might die if you leave it on, and uh, even when you allow the calcineurin inhibitor on board, this is just to balance, and uh, as soon as you feel the patient is deteriorating, then you also stop it. So it's a trial and uh, hopefully the patient comes out of it. But if not, we're ready to sacrifice the kidney to save the patient's life. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, I entirely agree with you, but we have to bear in mind that to some patients, to some patients actually, uh, you know, giving up and, uh, you know, sentencing a patient back to death is actually, it's almost like a life sentence. But I mean, you don't have, it, it is, you know, you, you either you do you are damned or you don't you are damned. Maybe the results are the same. I agree with you. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, Frida, any other questions or comments? Yes, there's a one more comment from the chat from Mazhal, Dr. Mazhal Amirali. He's saying, playing devil's advocate here, but doesn't ACI ARB interrupt pathophysiology of COVID infection, the relationship of spike protein and ACE receptor in the lung? Therefore, shouldn't continuing these drugs be beneficial given no contraindication present? Mazhar is being very naughty. He knows the answer to the question. That Thank is you. correct. The theoretically, uh, the theoretically, what he's saying is correct. But when it comes to clinical practice, uh, I don't know about Tanzania, but uh, in the UK, we by far almost always stop ACE and ARP therapy. You, the, the last thing you want for your COVID-19 kidney transplant recipient or your COVID-19 patient is to develop uh, renal dysfunction and AKI because that just adds uh, more, more troubles to your already long list of troubles that you have with, with patients. So in order to be on the safe side, it is always important to stop these drugs and to prescribe alternative antihypertensive agents. And if these patients are septic, then stop antihypertensive therapy altogether. Thank you so much, Dr. Mubarak. Thank you everybody for participation. Now, can I welcome Dr. Lloyd to say a word of thanks and then we can end up our session. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Mubarak. It was wonderful and always ready to come back to Tanzania. Uh, that is, that is uh, really outstanding. And uh, it was a wonderful session. And that's why I said, you know, we should have it once again so that more people can listen to it. Uh, thank you very much. We've had it recorded and we hope that we will put it up on YouTube shortly. So if anybody has missed it, it will be there as well.
Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. It's always a pleasure.